Part three of Maud, Prose and Verse by Christina Rossetti. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Agnes Clifton to Maud Foster, the twelfth of June, eighteen blank. My dear Maud, Mamma has written to my aunt that Mary's marriage is fixed for the fourth of next month, but as I fear we cannot expect you both so many days before the time, I also write hoping that you at least will come without delay. At any rate, I shall be at the station tomorrow afternoon with a chaise for your luggage, so pray take pity on my desolate condition, and avail yourself of the three o'clock train. As we are both bridesmaids elect, I thought it would be very nice for us to be dressed alike, so have procured double quantity of everything. Thus you will perceive no pretence remains for your lingering in smoky London. You will be amused when you see Mary, I have already lost my companion. Mr. Herbert calls at least once a day, but sometimes oftener, so all day long Mary is on the alert. She takes much more interest in the roses over the porch than was formerly the case. The creepers outside the window require continual training, not to say hourly care. I tell her the constitution of the garden must have become seriously weakened lately. One morning I caught her before the glass, trying the effect of syringa the English orange blossom, you know, in her hair. She looked such a darling. I hinted how flattered Mr. Herbert would feel when I told him, which provoked her to offer a few remarks on old maids. Was it not a shame? Last Thursday Magdalen Ellis was finally received into the Sisterhood of Mercy. I wished much to be present but could not, as the whole affair was conducted quite privately. Only her parents were admitted of the world." However, I made interest for a lock of her beautiful hair, which I prize highly. It makes me sad to look at it, yet I know she is chosen well, and will, if she perseveres, receive hereafter an abundant recompense for all she has forgone here. Sometimes I think whether such a life can be suited to me, but then I could not bear to leave Mamma. Indeed, that is just what Magdalen felt so much. I met her yesterday walking with some poor children. Her veil was down, nearly hiding her face. Still, I fancy she looked thoughtful, but very calm and happy. She says she always prays for me, and asked my prayers. So I begged her to remember you and Mary. Then she inquired how you are, desiring her kindest love to you, and assuring me she makes no doubt your name will be known at some future period. But, checking herself almost immediately, she added that she could fancy you very different as pale Sister Maud. This surprised me, I can fancy nothing of the sort. At last, she mentioned the verses you gave her months ago, which she knows by heart and values extremely. Then, having nearly reached my home, we parted. What a document I have composed! I, who have not one minute to spare from Mary's trousseau! Will you give my love to my aunt? and request her from me to permit your immediately coming to your affectionate cousin, Agnes M. Clifton. P.S. Mary would doubtless send a message were she in the room. I conjecture her to be lurking about somewhere in the watch. Goodbye, or rather, come. Maud handed the letter to her mother. Can you spare me, Mamma? I should like to go, but not if it is to inconvenience you. Certainly you shall go, my dear. It is a real pleasure to hear you express interest on some point, and you cannot be with any one I approve of more than Agnes. But you must make haste with the packing now. I will come and help you in a few minutes. Still Maud lingered. Did you see about Magdalen? I wonder what made her think of me as a sister. It is very nice of her, but then she is so good she never can conceive what I am like. Mamma. Should you mind my being a nun? Yes, my dear, it would make me miserable. But for the present, take my advice and hurry a little, or the train will leave without you. Thus urged, Maud proceeded to bundle various miscellaneous goods into a trunk, the only article on the safety of which she bestowed much thought being the present destined for Mary, a sofa pillow worked in glowing shades of wool and silk. This she wrapped carefully in a cloth and laid at the bottom. Then over it all else was heaped without much ceremony. Many were the delays occasioned by things mislaid, which must be looked for, ill-secured, which must be rearranged, or remembered too late, 
which yet could not be dispensed with, and so must be crammed in somewhere. At length, however, the tardy preparations were completed, and Maud, enveloped in two shawls, though it was the height of summer, stepped into a cab, promising strict conformity to her mother's injunction that both windows should be kept closed. Half an hour had not elapsed when another cab drove up to the door, and out of it Maud was lifted perfectly insensible. She had been overturned, and though no limb was broken, had neither stirred nor spoken since the accident. 2. Maud Foster to Agnes Clifton, 2nd July, 18 blank. My dear Agnes, you have heard of my mishap. It keeps me not bedridden, but sofa-ridden. My side is dreadfully hurt. I looked at it this morning for the first time, but hope never again to see so shocking a sight. The pain now and then is extreme, though not always so. Sometimes, in fact, I am unconscious of any injury. Will you convey my best love and wishes to Mary, and tell her how much I regret being away from her at such a time, especially as Mamma will not hear of leaving me? A day or two ago I tried to compose an epithalamium for our fair fiancé, which effort resulted in my present enclosure. Not much to the purpose, we must admit. You may read it when no better employment offers. The first nun no one can suspect of being myself, partly because my hair is far from yellow, and I do not wear curls, partly because I never did anything half so good as profess. The second might be Mary, had she mistaken her vocation. The third is Magdalen, of course. But whatever you miss, pray read the mottos. Put together, they form a most exquisite little song which the nuns sing in Italy. One can fancy Sister Magdalen repeating it with her whole heart. The surgeon comes twice a day to dress my wounds, Still, all the burden of nursing falls on poor Mamma. How I wish you were here to help us both. We should find plenty to say. But, perhaps, ere many months are past, I shall be up and about, when we may go together on a visit to Mary, a most delightful possibility. By the way, how I should love a baby of hers, and what a pretty little creature it ought to be. Do you think Mr. Herbert handsome? Hitherto I have only heard a partial opinion. Oh, my side! It gives an awful twinge now and then. You need not read my letter, but I must write it, for I am unable to do anything else. Did the pillow reach safely? It gave me so much pleasure to work it for Mary, who, I hope, likes it. At all events, if not to her taste, she may console herself with the reflection that it is unique, for the pattern was my own designing. Here comes dinner. Good-bye. When will anything so welcome as your kind face gladden the eyes of your affectionate Maud Foster? P.S. I have turned tippler lately on port wine three times a day. To keep you up, says my doctor, while I obstinately refuse to be kept up, but insist on becoming weaker and weaker. Mind you write me a full history of your grand doings on certain occasion, not omitting a detailed account of the lovely bride, her appearance, deportment, and toilet. Good-bye once more. When shall I see you all again? Three Nuns 1. Sospira questo core, e non sadir per se. Shadow, shadow on the wall, spread thy shelter over me, wrap me with a heavy pall, with the dark that none may see. Fold thyself around me. Come, shut out all the troublesome noise of life. I would be dumb. Shadow, thou hast reached my feet. Rise and cover up my head. Be my stainless winding sheet, buried before I am dead. Lay thy cool upon my breast. Once I thought that joy was best. Now I only care for rest. By the grating of my cell sings a solitary bird, Sweeter than the vesper bell, sweetest song was ever heard. Sing upon thy living tree, happy echoes answer thee, Happy songster, sing to me. When my yellow hair was curled, though men saw and called me fair, I was weary in the world, full of vanity and care. 
gold was left behind, curls shorn when I came here, that same morn made a bride no gems adorn. Here wrapped in my spotless veil, curtained from intruding eyes, I whom prayers and fasts turn pale, wait the flush of paradise. But the vigil is so long, my heart sickens, sing thy song, blithe bird that canst do no wrong. Sing on, making me forget present sorrow and past sin. Sing a little longer yet, soon the matins will begin. And I must turn back again to that aching worse than pain, I must bear and not complain. Sing, that in thy song I may dream myself once more a child, in the green woods far away, plucking clematis and wild hyacinths, till pleasure grew tired, yet so was pleasure too, resting with no work to do. In the thickest of the wood I remember, long ago, how a stately oak tree stood, with a sluggish pool below, almost shadowed out of sight, on the waters dark as night, water lilies lay like light. There, while yet a child, I thought I could live as in a dream, secret, neither found nor sought, till the lilies on the stream, pure as virgin purity, would seem scarce too pure for me. Ah, but that can never be. 2. Sospirera d'amore, mana lo dice a me. I loved him, yes, where was the sin? I loved him with my heart and soul, but I pressed forward to no goal. There was no prize I strove to win. Show me my sin that I may see. Throw the first stone, thou Pharisee. I loved him, but I never sought that he should know that I was fair. I prayed for him. Was my sin prayer? I sacrificed, he never bought, he nothing gave, he nothing took, we never bartered look for look. My voice rose in the sacred choir, the choir of nuns. Do you condemn, even if, when kneeling among them, faith, zeal, and love kindled a fire, and I prayed for his happiness, who knew not? Was my error this? I only prayed that in the end his trust and hope may not be vain. I prayed not we may meet again. I would not let our names ascend, no, not to heaven in the same breath, nor will I join the two in death. O oh, sweet is death, for I am weak and weary, and it giveth rest. The crucifix lies on my breast, and all night long it seems to speak of rest. I hear it through my sleep and the great comfort makes me weep. O oh, sweet is death that bindeth up the broken and the bleeding heart, the draught chilled but a cordial part lurked at the bottom of the cup, and for my patience will my Lord give an exceeding great reward. Yea, the reward is almost won, a crown of glory and a palm. Soon I shall sing the unknown psalm, soon gaze on light, not on the sun and soon with sure faith shall pray for him, and cease not night nor day. My life is breaking like a cloud, God judgeth not as man doth judge. Nay, bear with me, you need not grudge this peace, the vows that I have vowed have all been kept, eternal strength holds me, though mine own fails at length. Bury me in the convent ground among the flowers that are so sweet, and lay a green turf at my feet, where thick trees cast a gloom around. At my head let a cross be, white through the long blackness of the night. Now kneel and pray beside my bed, that I may sleep being free from pain, and pray that I may wake again after his likeness, who hath said, Faithful is he who promiseth, we shall be satisfied therewith. 3. Respondimi, cor mio, per se sospiri tu. Risponde. Volio idio, sospiro, per Gesù. My heart is as a freeborn bird caged in my cruel breast that flutters, flutters evermore, nor sings, nor is at rest, but beats against the prison bars 
as knowing its own nest far off beyond the clouded west my soul is as a hidden fount shut in by clammy clay that struggles with an upward moan striving to force its way up through the turf over the grass up up into the day where twilight no more turneth grey oh for the grapes of the true vine growing in paradise whose tendrils join the tree of life to that which maketh wise growing beside the living well whose sweetest waters rise where tears are wiped from tearful eyes oh for the waters of that well round which the angels stand oh for the shadow of the rock on my heart's weary land oh for the voice to guide me when i turn to either hand guiding me till i reach heaven's strand thou world from which i am come out keep all thy gems and gold keep thy delights and precious things thou that art waxing old my heart shall beat with a new life when thine is dead and cold when thou dost fear i shall be bold when earth shall pass away with all her pride and pomp of sin the city builded without hands shall safely shut me in all the rest is but vanity which others strive to win where their hopes end my joys begin i will not look upon a rose though it is fair to see the flowers planted in paradise are budding now for me red roses like love visible are blowing on their tree or white like virgin purity i will not look unto the sun which setteth night by night in the untrodden courts of heaven my crown shall be more bright so in the new jerusalem founded and built aright my very feet shall tread on light with foolish riches of this world i have bought treasure where naught perisheth for this white veil i gave my golden hair i gave the beauty of my face for vigils fasts and prayer i gave all for this cross i bear my heart trembled when first i took the vows which must be kept at first it was a weariness to watch when once i slept the path was rough and sharp with thorns my feet bled as i stepped the cross was heavy and i wept while still the names rang in mine ears of daughter sister wife the outside world still looked so fair to my weak eyes and rife with beauty my heart almost failed then in the desperate strife i prayed as one who prays for life until i grew to love what once had been so burdensome so now when i am faint because hope deferred seems to numb my heart i yet can plead and say although my lips are dumb the spirit and the bride say come three three weeks had passed away a burning sun seemed baking the very dust in the streets and sucking the last remnant of moisture from the straw spread in front of mrs foster's house when the sound of a low muffled ring was heard in the sick-room and maud now entirely confined to her bed raising herself on one arm looked eagerly towards the door which opened to admit a servant with the welcome announcement that agnes had arrived after tea mrs foster almost worn out with fatigue went to bed leaving her daughter under the care of their guest the first greetings between the cousins had passed sadly enough agnes perceived at a glance that maud was as her last letter hinted in a most alarming state while the sick girl well aware of her condition received her friend with an emotion which showed she felt it might be for the last time but soon her spirits rallied i shall enjoy our evening together so much agnes said she speaking now quite cheerfully you must tell me all the news have you heard from mary since your last dispatch to me mamma received a letter this morning before i set off and she sent it hoping to amuse you shall i read it aloud no let me have it myself her eye travelled rapidly down the well-filled pages comprehending at a glance all the tale of happiness mr and mrs herbert were at scarborough they would thence proceed to the lakes and thence most probably homewards though a prolonged tour was mentioned as just possible but both plans seemed alike pleasing to mary for she was full of her husband 
and both were equally connected with him. Maud smiled as paragraph after paragraph enlarged on the same topic. At last she said, Agnes, if you could not be yourself, but must become one of us three, I don't mean as to goodness, of course, but merely as regards circumstances, would you change with Sister Magdalen, with Mary, or with me? Not with Mary, certainly. Neither should I have courage to change with you. I never should bear pain so well. Nor yet with Sister Magdalen, for I want her fervour of devotion. So at present I fear you must even put up with me as I am. Will that do? There was a pause. A fresh wind had sprung up and the sun was setting. At length Maud resumed. Do you recollect last Christmas Eve, when I was so wretched, what shocking things I said? How I rejoiced that my next communion was not indeed delayed till sickness had stripped me of temptation and sin together. Did I say that? It was very harsh. Not harsh. It was just and right as far as it went. Only something more was required. But I never told you what altered me. The truth is, for a time I avoided as much as possible frequenting our parish church, for fear of remark. Mamma, knowing how I love St. Andrews, let me go there very often by myself, because the walk is too long for her. I wanted resolution to do right, yet believe me I was very miserable. How I could say my prayers at that period is a mystery. So matters went on, till one day I was returning from a shop, I met Mr. Paulson. He inquired immediately whether I had been staying in the country. Of course I answered no. Had I been ill? Again, no. Then gradually the whole story came out. I never shall forget the shame of my admissions. Each word seemed forced from me. Yet at last all was told. I will not repeat all we said then, and on a subsequent occasion when he saw me at church, the end was that I partook of the Holy Communion on Easter Sunday. That was indeed a feast. I felt as if I could never do wrong again. And yet... Well, after my next impatient fit, I wrote this. Here she took a paper from the table. Do you care to see it? I will rest a little, for talking is almost too much for me. I watched a rosebud very long, brought on by dew and sun and shower, waiting to see the perfect flower. Then, when I thought it should be strong, it opened at the matin hour and fell at evensong. I watched a nest from day to day, a green nest full of pleasant shade, wherein three little eggs were laid. But when they should have hatched in May, the two old birds had grown afraid, or tired, and flew away. Then in my wrath I broke the bough that I had tended with such care, hoping its scent should fill the air. I crushed the eggs, not heeding how their ancient promise had been fair. I would have vengeance now. But the dead branch spoke from the sod, and the eggs answered me again. Because we failed, dost thou complain? Is thy wrath just? And what if God, who waiteth for thy fruits in vain, should also take the rod? You can keep it if you like, continued Maud, when her cousin had finished reading. Only don't let anyone else know why it was written. And Agnes... It would only pain Mamma to look over everything if I die. Will you examine the verses, and destroy what I evidently never intended to be seen? They might all be thrown away together, only Mamma is so fond of them. What will she do? And the poor girl hid her face in the pillows. But is there no hope, then? Not the slightest, if you mean of recovery, and she does not know it. Don't go away when all's over but do what you can to comfort her. I have been her misery from my birth. Till now there is no time to do better. But you must leave me, please, for I feel completely exhausted. Or stay one moment. I saw Mr. Paulson again this morning, and he promised to come tomorrow to administer the blessed sacrament to me. So I count on you and Mamma receiving with me for the last time, perhaps. Will you? Yes, dear Maud. But you are so young, don't give up hope. And 
now would you like me to remain here during the night i can establish myself quite comfortably on your sofa thank you but it could only make me restless good night my own dear agnes good night dear maud i trust to rise early to-morrow that i may be with you all the sooner so they parted agnes proceeded to perform the task imposed upon her with scrupulous anxiety to carry out her friend's wishes the locked book she never opened but had it placed on maud's coffin with all its records of folly sin vanity and she humbly trusted of true penitence also she next collected the scraps of paper found in her cousin's desk and portfolio or lying loose upon the table and proceeded to examine them many of these were mere fragments many half-effaced pencil scrawls and some written on torn backs of letters and some full of incomprehensible abbreviations agnes was astonished at the variety of maud's compositions piece after piece she committed to the flames fearful lest any should be preserved which were not intended for general perusal but it cost her a pang to do so and to see how small a number remained for mrs foster of three only she took copies for herself the first was dated ten days after maud's accident sleep let me sleep for i am sick of care sleep let me sleep for my pain wearies me shut out the light thicken the heavy air with drowsy incense let a distant stream of music lull me languid as a dream soft as the whisper of a summer sea pluck me no rose that groweth on a thorn no myrtle white and cold as snow in june fit for a virgin on her marriage morn but bring me poppies brimmed with sleepy death and ivy choking what it garlandeth and primroses that open to the moon listen the music swells into a song a simple song i loved in days of yore the echoes take it up and up along the hills and the wind blows it back again peace peace there is a memory in that strain of happy days that shall return no more o oh, peace your music wakeneth old thought but not old hope that made my life so sweet only the longing that must end in naught have patience with me friends a little while for soon where ye shall dance and sing and smile my quickened dust may blossom at your feet sweet thought that i may yet live and grow green that leaves may yet spring from the withered root and birds and flowers and berries half unseen then if you haply muse upon the past say this poor child she hath her wish at last barren through life but in death bearing fruit the second though written on the same paper was evidently composed at a subsequent period fade tender lily fade o crimson rose fade every flower sweetest flower that blows go chilly autumn come o winter cold let the green stalks die away into common mould birth follows hard on death life unwithering hasten we shall come the sooner back to pleasant spring the last was a sonnet dated the morning before her death what is it jesus saith unto the soul take up the cross and come and follow me this word he saith to all no man may be without the cross wishing to win the goal then take it bravely up setting thy whole body to bear it will not weigh on thee beyond thy utmost strength take it for he knoweth when thou art weak and will control the powers of darkness that thou needst not fear he will be with thee helping strengthening until it is enough for lo the day cometh when he shall call thee thou shall hear his voice that says winter is past and spring is come arise my love and come away agnes cut one long tress from maud's head and on her return home laid it in the same paper with the lock of magdalen's hair these she treasured greatly and gazing on them would long and pray for the hastening of that eternal morning which shall reunite in god those who in him or for his sake have parted here 
Amen for us all. End of Part 3 End of Maud by Christina Rossetti